He took a sip of the beer and went on back into the bedroom and dropped to one knee and shoved the case under the bed. Then he came back. I got you some cigarettes, he said. Let me get them. He left the beer on the counter and went out and got the two packs of cigarettes and the binoculars and the pistol and slung the 270 over his shoulder and shut the truck door and came back in. He handed her the cigarettes and went on back to the bedroom. Where'd you get that pistol? She called. At the getting place. Did you buy that thing? No. I found it. She sat up on the sofa. Llewellyn. He came back in. What? He said. Quit hollering. What did you give for that thing? You don't need to know everything. How much? I told you. I found it. No, you never done no such a thing. He sat on the sofa and put his legs up on the coffee table and sipped the beer. It don't belong to me, he said. I didn't buy no pistol. You better not of. She opened one of the packs of cigarettes and took one out and lit it with a lighter. Where have you been all day? Went to get you some cigarettes. I don't even want to know. I don't even want to know what all you've been up to. He sipped the beer and nodded. That'll work, he said. I think it's better just to not even know even. You keep running that mouth, and I'm going to take you back there and screw you. Big talk. Just keep it up. That's what she said. Just let me finish this beer. We'll see what she said and what she didn't say. When he woke, it was 1.06 by the digital clock on the bedside table. He lay there looking at the ceiling, the raw glare of the vapor lamp outside, bathing the bedroom in a cold and bluish light, like a winter moon, or some other kind of moon, something stellar and alien in its light that he'd come to feel comfortable with, anything but sleep in the dark. He swung his feet from under the covers and sat up. He looked at her naked back, her hair on the pillow. He reached and pulled the blanket up over her shoulder and got up and went into the kitchen. He took the jar of water from the refrigerator and unscrewed the cap, and stood there drinking in the light of the open refrigerator door. Then he just stood there holding the jar, with the water beating cold on the glass, looking out the window and down the highway toward the lights. He stood there for a long time. When he went back to the bedroom, he got his shorts off the floor and put them on, and went into the bathroom and shut the door. Then he went through into the second bedroom, and pulled the case from under the bed and opened it. He sat in the floor with the case between his legs and delved down into the bills and dredged them up. The packets were twenty deep. He shoved them back down into the case and jostled the case on the floor to level the money. Times twelve. He could do the math in his head. Two point four million. All used bills. He sat looking at it. You have to take this seriously, he said. You can't treat it like luck. He closed the bag and redid the fasteners and shoved it under the bed and rose and stood looking out the window at the stars over the rocky escarpment to the north of the town. Dead quiet. Not even a dog. But it wasn't the money that he woke up about. Are you dead out there? He said. Hell no. You ain't dead. She woke while he was getting dressed and turned in the bed to watch him. Llewellyn? Yeah. What are you doing? Getting dressed. Where are you going? Out. Where are you going, baby? Something I forgot to do. I'll be back. What are you going to do? He opened the drawer and took the forty-five out and ejected the clip and checked it and put it back and put the pistol in his belt. He turned and looked at her. I'm fixin' to go do something dumber than hell, but I'm going anyways. If I don't come back, tell Mother I love her. Your mother's dead, Llewellyn. Well, I'll tell her myself then. She sat up in the bed. You're scaring the hell out of me, Llewellyn. Are you in some kind of trouble? No. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. I'll be back in a bit. Damn you, Llewellyn. He stepped back into the doorway and looked at her. What if I was to not come back? Is them your last words? She followed him down the hallway to the kitchen, pulling on her robe. He took an empty gallon jug from under the sink and stood filling it at the tap. 
Do you know what time it is? She said. Yeah, I know what time it is. Baby, I don't want you to go. Where are you going? I don't want you to go. Well, darling, we're eye to eye on that. Because I don't want to go, neither. I'll be back. Don't wait up on me. He pulled in at the filling station under the lights and shut off the motor and got the survey map from the glove box and unfolded it across the seat and sat there studying it. He finally marked where he thought the trucks should be, and then he traced a route cross-country back to Harkel's cattle gate. He had a good set of all-terrain tires on the truck and two spares in the bed, but this was some hard country. He sat looking at the line he'd drawn, 